Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk uh, about something very different, which is uh, let's say a hands-on dealing with MPI, not necessarily looking at improvements in MPI tooling, uh, because one of the challenges we face is the HPC that we use it one run the MPI and one that seamlessly is possible to have it to scale and not necessarily think about it, right? Um, uh, well, I'm going to try to turn off something. No, oh, that's. I'll leave it there. Okay. Um, so uh, before I start, I'd also like to model country. So uh, the Gala Cadix and New Garment Pine Cadix in the Ninja Bujo. So we are in uh, New Garment here uh, in Perth. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the elders past and present of the New Garment people. Um, and then I'm going to carry on. So uh, I'm going to preface this. this Kind of interesting idea. So the the crucible for this utility was Cytonics. It was phase one Cytonics, and all the MPI works that came around with finally run production codes on Cytonics, the Cray system, the Cray XC system, with the Cray image, with some uh, communication libraries in the hood that do all the communication. And it would pass acceptance tests of like HPL and other things. So then people ran production codes and they like multi node production codes and they Started crashing, stalling, everything else. So, not all of the peripherals are impacted, but enough that with key stakeholders, like we can't even run on the system, what's wrong with the API, it's like, oh, they pass uh, some, something. But we did have these sort of real diagnostic tests for the API to see how it was behaving, because it's like a complete review of Crave, right? This is a, you have a black box that does all this handling, and then outside, you have to then hope that it works. Uh, so, so we started developing unit tests and logging and all this stuff. And this was the crucible for this this particular utility that I'm just going to mention. That could be useful for some people. So this is this was meant to be a poster, and it's a short talk. So I'm going to try to keep it short because you know we've got other things that we can chat about. So the motivation was to address performance bottlenecks critical to running efficiently at scale, but also look hangs. Um, I didn't want to. We, we, it wasn't useful to necessarily use a full profiling tool because we didn't want to necessarily instrument every single code and recompile codes. We just wanted something that could be quickly stuck in, but then also could be used on production environments. So a quick update to a code and then keep running. <clears throat> the, um, now there's a wide variety of uh, you know really uh, codes available or the tools uh, so toolkits available to like fully instrument. Some are open source, some are closed source, some are commercial, uh, but they really do. Uh, instrument everything, and that is not necessarily the high-level view that I want to gain out of running for the black box. I wanted a very high-level view, like, is this stalling? Why is it stalling? Oh, it's at this message. Okay, that, that's all I wanted. I didn't want a full instrumentation. So that, that was, uh, and especially if I'm going to run, let's say, regression tests on a system, it's not useful to try to instrument everything, run the regression test, parse the entire set, and go, this is what failed, or this is what passed. So this profile tool is an open source library. Anybody can grab it. It uses C++20, CMake, uh, it's MPI and OpenMP, and it's GPU-ish agnostic in the sense that it's fine with CUDA and HIP. Uh, Intel, I've not tried opening, including OpenSQL, but one of the things I'm trying to work on. Uh, and it's got a simple MPI for integration to C++, working on the C and working on the Fortran. Um, uh, this is an example of a source code where I've got normally some silly code uh, but you can see some extra additions with MPI logging where you pacify a communicator and then you can log and get it to spit out all the parallel API. You can spit all the binding. You'd be surprised how useful the binding information is of what GPUs are given to what rank, what cores are given to what rank when we're doing OpenMP threading because on these systems, I mean, we just had this chat where we have these many core, many NUMA regions and also many GPUs. And sometimes in the context of running stuff, you uh, an MPI, if you say, I'm going to run an MPI and I'm going to give it eight threads each, you might not get the threads you expect. So the core affinity has actually been really tricky. The GPU affinity you think might be sort of naive to do, but it's not. So some of the things we're running just slower and we're like, ah, oh, it's literally when you see the code and you just ask, what, what, are, you, what are you getting as compute resources? Like, oh, this is, this is normally the worst map you could get. That's why this code is slow because Normally, we think it's doing something correct, and it's not. Uh, so I'll just spit out some stuff like this, just as an example. This is just meant to give you a sense of, like, maybe it'll be useful for you. So you can get the parallel API, which spits out, you know, how many, what the total com world size is, the OpenMP version, the number of threads per MPI, the number of GPUs that it sees, what it's running with, 
uh, and then core binding with like rank thread is zero thread nested at level one core affinity zero to seven, zero to seven. Uh, you know, that gives you the thread information. It gives you the GPU information kind of straight away with, uh, you know, the node it's on, the ranking that it has, the PCI address, right? You've got this bus ID. And this actually was super useful for us to also figure out some GPU quirks. So it's there. Uh, there's also some timing and sampling. So this is kind of useful for looking at, this is, I mean, timing is everything, but uh, it's kind of everywhere, but the sampling was kind of useful. So looking at GPU usage, uh, because we also had codes that said, I'm offloading to a GPU. And then you would look at the GPU usage and it would be zero because the code had a GPU, but it never went through the process of actually going through the bit of the workflow that offloaded to the GPU or just never offloaded. And so there were some complaints that like, oh, I'm not using any, it's really slower than it should be. And it's because it's possible that it was using zero GPUs. So we tried sticking some unit tests and like making sure that you're actually grabbing GPUs or not oversubscribing GPUs. And there's there's memory usage as well, which is uh, the thing I'm going to focus on first. So user case, so I'm using Cytonix here as a motivator, right? So we had all these MPI issues in phase one Cytonix, uh, and it was a real conundrum, like this this game of Cluedo, where you're trying to find clues and trying to figure out who did the the crime. Uh, but it was very it was not obvious, right? So we just had multi-node jobs that would crash with a variety of errors. Uh, bus errors, generic slurm, out of memory errors, XP mem, every single sort of error message you can imagine would just show up. So again, this is the black box, right? I don't know what KM pitch is doing, and I don't know what UCX or OFI, these communication libraries are trying to do, and I can't really dive into them. So this made it a real challenge. Uh, we also had poor scaling where it would just behave terribly. Uh, you could just run certain scale and then it would just, the the you could have codes that would fall over, so they would take a very long time. LAMPS was a good example where it worked well in some context, and then as we scaled it up, it got very, 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 very slow. Uh, for, again, as a production code, for reasons, right? We couldn't necessarily quickly identify what the issue was, and we could have tried instrumenting everything and gone through a deep dive, but that also is a long process and may not have been that enlightening. So it was easier to kind of do representative samples of something and just high-level views. <clears throat> so we had reduced node memory as well. This was a, a big puzzle. We'd come back to nodes and sometimes they'd have less available memory. I'm like, what, what happened? Uh, initially, it was just assumed that people were filling up slash temp. So our nodes obviously have some node memory that can be used as a file system, but that wasn't the case. Uh, and then instability as well. Uh, the one that I really love uh, is actually hangs. So uh, we, uh, for people who were here, uh, or uh, Sarah Pierce's talk with talking about radio astronomy. So if you're doing processing from a radio telescope, it's asynchronous, right? Different different MPI ranks will have very different workloads. So it's a, it, I mean, they're still gonna try to possibly do the same thing, but the process involves iteration and can be immediately decided like an MPI rank. And so I got some data that I'm supposed to process in a memory, like a given frequency channel, but that data is terrible. So I don't have anything to do. So I just finish. I'm done and I want the next bit, but I have to communicate that I'm done for this bit data processing for all the other MPI ranks. And then the MPI ranks can take ages. And so we just had things hang. Like there's no information other than the code just stayed. We checked the log information and it was like still running, nothing was happening. Um, and like, what's going on? So that was a really interesting one because it's radio time is a critical part of POSI. And so if they can't run, that's a huge deal. And they literally could not run any real processing with real data, I was like on on any nodes. So they ran two nodes, it would fail. Uh, and it was it was uh, the idea is that they couldn't fit on a single node. So they was looking at intra <laughs> node communication. Um, but this is sort of the the mess that we were trying to disentangle with some high level view of what MPI was doing. Um, so I mentioned the crime scene, right? So the evidence was was. Uh, found, and I'm not saying a solution was found, but the idea was just constructing unit tests that convey lots of different MPI communications. So there's always two benchmarks. There's a bunch of them out there, right? They don't necessarily do the plethora of all the MPI communications you can imagine a code might do. This idea of just delays between a posting a send and then posting a receive or posting a receive and then posting a send. Most times there's not like massive gaps in the physical wall time between when these instructions are placed. 
Here, there could be 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour between when a receive and a send, the, 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 uh, you know, the associated send are placed because of the way the workflow is. You have a real-time system to pumping in data. You can get sort of quite asynchronous behavior. So I was then just looking at MPI logging of memory and also node memory. It sounds silly, but that was literally like, what does the node think is actually available? What are all the processes consuming in terms of memory? And then there was this massive gap if you generated enough messages, and it only happened if you have generated enough messages across nodes. So if you had one message going across nodes, nothing really happened. If you had 10, you'd suddenly notice that the memory available of the node would suddenly be consumed at a higher rate than what's predicting, and also that would stay. Uh, and that was memory leaks in not MPI. There was nothing supposedly wrong with the MPI library. It was a communication library. So UCX and OFI had these issues where if we hadn't had this dive into logging at a high level, it would have been much harder for them to triage the Cray. So this is why I'm like, this is, could be useful as a quick thing to integrate in some, some production workflows because they can always just port it over, run again, and be like, something weird's gone, but I, and you don't have to have a fully instrument recompile and, re, and rerun this heavily instrumented code. Because also, uh, let's say for the delay hang, when we ran this, these tests and trying to do unit tests and like where we're, or try to do simplified tests of the entire production code, you couldn't get these time gaps. So then we artificially started putting in sleeps, right? And then if you put in sleeps with two things that were on the same node, nothing happened. You had to put sleeps across two things that were on different nodes, and it just stayed. And the idea there is you could look at it and you're like, well, the memory suddenly increased, so the message is somewhere, uh, but not on the node it's supposed to receive it. So why, All right? Uh, I'm not saying I necessarily exactly figured out, but there were memory leaks, bugs, and some uh, corruption of data that was essentially resulting in all these issues. And it's only because we had something that was kind of providing all these logging details at a high level that someone could quickly do, so Cray could quickly run again, that they could actually diagnose and like, oh yeah, this is a bug, this is a memory leak, this is, we can see it happening. Um, the other one was just also Grasshoppers. So we have Grasshoppers, they have lots of cores, they have one GPU, they have uh, interesting behavior in terms of GPU performance as you increase the number of CPU usage uh, because it has to do with the power throttling envelope. So we were getting some really funny behavior initially. Um, and this was uh, just, this is a separate thing. It's not really MPI, but it's just something that could be interesting for people who are doing GPU stuff where you're looking at the relative time normalized by thread activity. So this is uh, a, a, just a standard computational job that takes some number of time, but then normalized by one, and then you just increase the number of threads, and they, this is, they all do the same amount of work. So the, and there's no thread interdependency. They all have their own isolated bits of memory, uh, and you can look at uh, the amount of time it takes for threads to complete, uh, and the dis dispersion around that time, and it takes a long time uh, when you get to a huge number of threads, and the GPU is here is always active across the, this time, and the GPU slows down as well. And this is power consumption was the assumption, but then we didn't have anything that was sampling at this as well. So we then went into, you know, had the sampler to look at CPU usage in that window and the CPU usage stays high. Uh, the, so it's not like the CPUs are running somehow weirdly at lower efficiency. They're running at an efficiency, but the, the frequency is being throttled during this workflow. So they could all consume less power so you can power the GPU. And the same here, GPU usage is pretty good till it tanks. Uh, when you consume enough threads. So this kind of gave us an idea. NVIDIA, I was like, I tried to get an idea from NVIDIA how to best operate these Grasshopper nodes, but this was the more informative uh, process of actually doing it so I could look at it live with lots of compute happening. Um, and yeah, we have just the idea of like energy, so normalized power. The GPU at a certain point is always consuming roughly the same amount of power till it really drops the power consumption because the, 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 the chiplet has to power the threads that are running on Grace. At 50 cores, it's suddenly there's a huge drop in the amount of power that's consumed by the GPU. Uh, and so that's the that's the spike you see in the, sort of the time it takes to run on the GPU. So you suddenly get the spike of like 15% slower because the power has been reduced. Uh, and the, um, I should point as well, if you change sort of the thread allocation and so on, like you go to different threads as you fill this up, it's not really thread dependent. It doesn't seem to care if you're using 15 threads spread with some weird gap or some random 15 threads, sorry. It's just 15 threads or 50 threads, total number of threads usage. And then you can suddenly get the GPU drop. 
So uh, I just wanted to mention this sort of just like a quick little ad. If you wanted to uh, have a look at this, it could be useful to integrate in some codes if you're just starting to develop, because it's high level instrumentation. It's not really deep level, but it's pretty useful because it doesn't take much. You can still run in production at like 10,000 cores. If you're running a 10,000 core job, you probably don't want it instrumented, but some high level logging could be very useful to see how it's behaving because I also noticed certain things happening at much, much larger core counts. So 1,000 fine, 8,000, eh, 10,000, oh, something went weird. This was sort of useful to debug that weird threshold of breakage versus non-breakage because it wasn't very obvious what was going on. And I couldn't do a deep dive in, right? It's not like I could debug the MPI library to figure out what was going wrong. So this was kind of good logging to kind of just be like, what's going on actually? And they were like, MPI rank has sent something. And MPI rank, all the other MPI ranks have received, but one MPI rank has not received, and it's specifically because it's jumped across a couple of nodes, uh, and that somehow has done something. Exactly why that would be a communication library error, but this was sort of useful. Uh, and I will end there. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions? Thanks for the talk. Um, I had a conversation with someone who is maintaining or installing and maintaining MPI libraries, and their experience was kind of similar. But for them, it was like, oh, well, our users doing all these workarounds in their code because it's slower. And then it turns out UTX was misconfigured on the system. Yeah. Right. Um, so there's a huge effort spent on trying to understand the full software stack. I was wondering if you had any, um, if you had made any attempt to uh, combine different streams of information to better understand what's going on in the deeper levels uh, below MPI. Yeah, so we, I mean, we always do for the, the this sort of regression testing that we're doing, we check MPI unit tests, we do this lots of logging, but we also check usually the node health. So we actually talk to the nodes directly to see what they think they're doing, seeing where processes are being pinned. Uh, if there's any sort of extra um, uh, OS uh, processes, that like context switching can be an issue. That's what we notice as well. Some context switching could slow down some stuff. If there's lots of little services running and you're filling up the the the, the node, and you're filling up the node with, let's say, lots of MPI, but not lots of threads. Threads might not be so bad if you're doing context switching, but if MPI and you're switching uh, and you have lots of threads coming in and out, it's a it's a bit of a hassle. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do try to combine multiple lines of evidence when we're trying to, to, to that, I mean, that was one of the things we were thinking, like, do we have to, re, is, is LAMPS running slow because we need to, can we configure LAMPS? And it's like, surely not. It's It should be good. And so that's why we, we're very hesitant to say people reek our architect stuff is like, no, no, there's there's something wrong. Let's have a deep dive of node health. The slingshot fabric as well. So we have some diagnostics from the fabric, but it's not as informative. There's an example of a really funny one where there's a subtle thing. If you have enough IO traffic uh, and enough MPI traffic, uh, before we had the, a plugin that was doing this, you could get things hanging. And the idea is that you could see that the MPI processes would hang waiting for something that, uh, and it had to be internode communication, and it also had to be while I.O. was happening across the luster fabric with parallel I.O., and then you could get a hang. Uh, and that's a funny thing, which is because you had to have enough traffic across the network of the virtual network interfaces that are set up for the MPI to have this hang. So we, yeah, we definitely try to combine lots of different lines of information. I, I hear you, Payne. Just to add to that, we also looked higher up the stack at Sloan because its yeah. configuration also had issues. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. <clears throat> you said that um, you develop your own micro benchmarks more or less to test a certain functionality. Can you say again, like why you needed to do it? Because like there are like different test suites out, like for example, MPitch has its own test suite, and uh, yeah, all. they have lots of test suites, but they didn't necessarily replicate the weird quirks that we were running. So we were running into edge cases, right? This idea of this like random delay, where you could pick ranks, and if they're on the same node, and you delayed the asynchronous communication enough, 
that, that's fine. But then the idea is I wanted to be able to like tailor, like put a time delay and increase it and then move the, the, the receiving rank and the order of the send receives to on node, off node. That that's not, I mean, it's a weird test to do, right? So that doesn't exist in any framework, but that's the test that helped us be like, that's what's going on. That's why this production code is hanging. And so it, it's sort of the edge cases of it, the of the MPI communication that happens in production codes, which might not be the most efficient MPI deployment, but it's definitely not covered in benchmarking because you usually like, why are you doing this? Uh, and that's why. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Maybe somebody else. Um, so just to clarify, when you call some logging information from the program, is that run synchronously with the program? Uh, so it's run it's run synchronously with the program. You can obviously yeah. spawn a thread and then do some profile. I was going to ask if you would think that would be worth the extra complexity to do that. Yes. So I, it's definitely been useful for me. Yeah. Uh, so I've done something where I've, I've, I've spawned a, a process that's a separate thread and uncoupled it, or specifically said, I'm going to run two threads and I'm going to do some communication while something's running. Yep, yep. Uh, I haven't figured a nice way to make that like, so I'm working on kind of making that just a single instruction so that it does it all for you. Yeah. Uh, the sampler does that, right? So it spawns a, a thread and then runs a process. And that process is literally like NV NVIDIA SMI, get some, some power utility. But the other stuff as well for looking at like what's happening while the node memory. So the, a node memory system sampler is what I'm working on where you spawn a thread and it just pings essentially free as things are happening so that you can just look at what's what's really fine. Because that would have been super useful as well for that first in memory leaks. When we're like, look, you can see the jump when you get to like, it's like something in the weird number of messages above some certain size going across the internode fabric. Suddenly the memory leak starts happening. Yeah, in progress. Oh, thanks. Okay, then maybe another question yeah. from my side. Um, you mentioned you run this on 10,000 processes easily. Yeah. Uh, how do you do the data collection actually? I just saw this logger, so you have yeah. a navigation scheme and where do you store this then? So so, so the, the default is just log to standard out, but then uh, because obviously the, also the logging information obviously specifies the thread uh, uh, well, we'll specify the thread if it's threaded, but it'll specify the rank, the timestamp, and so on. And then I have some scripts, but you can also specify an OS stream. Uh, and usually, yeah, the idea was a post-processing. So you get this log file that would hopefully go into, uh, if I if I was really careful, I would love it to do go into slash temp so that there's no sort of IO footprint, and then corral it afterwards, and then post-process to look at the MPI. That's what I was doing. It was just basically grepping for like system memory stuff during the, the course of the logging. Um, yeah. Okay. So no, no fancy database needed for. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it could be cool. Yeah. <clears throat> we are working on a database, but the database will be separate. So yeah. the database will pick up this information from these logs and then stick it somewhere. Okay.